Hello listeners, welcome to Quote and Quote with KK. This is the healthcare uh, podcast of season 2021. I wanted to bring up a very serious issue that all of us have faced with regards to our parents who are seen senior citizens around the world. Some of them uh, have been lonely living in prolonged isolation during the covid lockdown and let me also kind of bring out my own personal experience my dad was a cardiac uh, patient and i've seen uh, him uh, go down on his fitness and his uh, his well being during the covid lockdown obviously i've given him a smart watch to monitor his uh, you know activity and what not but things don't work the what you think well for your parents and i'm not just the only one There are 130 million senior citizens in India. Uh, I've got Ravi Bala, who is a tech evangelist out of US, and he understands the Indian diaspora as well as the US diaspora as well. I would love to just uh, quickly introduce Ravi from his uh, background and what he has done. Ravi is a tech startup mentor in age tech and remote monitoring he is a co-founder and former board member at health signals leader in technology solutions for better senior living as an innovator and expert in mobile health conversational ai and digital strategy he has a successful track record of creating and managing teams of independent thinkers he has a tenacious dedication and compassion and dignity in the workplace uh, as a teacher mentor and coach uh, at heart Ravi works with several startups as an advisor. He is currently chair of uh, Capital for Good and board member for Girls First Fund, a global effort to end child marriages, which is very interesting effort. Ravi, I must commend you. He w- he was a board member of a startup corp and a member of Drexel University Age Well Collaboratory. He has taught courses in digital strategy in multiple MBA colleges in Philadelphia. His latest passion is changing the model for elder care with the aid of, of conversational AI, robotic and passive no touch monitoring. So welcome Ravi. I must say Ravi is also doesn't look like a senior citizen but he is so fit and uh, very young and I'm sure the passion with which what he's driving for his peer senior citizens I'm sure he should be young at heart as well so ravi uh, <laughs> let me start uh, <laughs> by talking about now that uh, the covid pandemic will see its end hopefully in the next few months with the immunization drive across the world hopefully the senior citizens would be the first cohort of population after the you know the frontline health workers and what have you what sort of uh, applications or ideas you think we need to have for our senior citizens in this transition time of going out of pan- pandemic to the new normal along the immunization time are there any solutions that you think are already available or we need to probably bring some sort of solutions for the interim so that you can monitor any you know adverse events or allergies or whatever you ha- you get out of some of these you know vaccination in the senior citizens any ideas or thoughts there you know i'll i'll, I'll address one of the larger issues earlier on and this is this is uh, the thing that the senior citizens or all of us really need in the, in this time of crisis is we're all tired of being isolated and we can't wait to get back together with friends and family and all of that stuff and and i think zoom calls only go so far in terms of being able to uh, you know on 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 a laptop what i've found about 2 or 3 years ago i actually uh, uh, you know when my parents lived in this retirement community in India in Coimbatore I actually uh, uh, installed a Alexa Echo show on their in their home and I have one in my kitchen uh, table and every morning we just do a 5 minute quick check in mom dad how are you doing and that video call really makes a big difference and then there are some days when my wife and I would both both take it and we'll set it up next to the window and show them the snow and uh, show them what I mean, my dad loves the, loves looking at the snow outside cuz he misses it in Coimbatore you know and and that communication is incredibly important however you set it up 
and you have to set it up in a way that doesn't make them feel like they have to log on to a computer or they hold a phone in front of their face. So these the, something with a far field microphone, even if it's a dedicated machine. So I, I really love, you know, whether it's the Google, you know, Nest home thing, uh, the, the Alexa Echo Show. I'm okay with the speakers, but I'd much rather have the video. And uh, off late, we experimented. My in-laws live about an hour and a half away from us. And so we've installed the Facebook Portal TV. And the Portal TV essentially plugged into their 55-inch television. And, you know, my kids have it. We have it. My sister has it. So when we talk, we're actually, you know, looking at each other on a 50, 70-inch screen. And we're sitting far away on a sofa. It pans the whole living room. So it's, a, it's more of a telepresence than it is uh, just a conference. That communication is incredibly important in the, at, at this stage. Yeah, and then there are, of course, other technologies that are more tactical in nature. Yeah, uh, people want to know things like, hey, you want to measure oxygen, oxygen levels, you know, SpO2. Uh, you know, not everybody has a pulse ox, not everybody can get a pulse. You want to measure, uh, you know, the temperature, uh, you want to measure heart rate, heart rate variability, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, you know, temperature you can measure with a therm thermometer, almost everybody has it, but the, all the other things people don't have everybody has one of these you know smartphone devices right you know they've got they've, they've all got these smartphone devices I, for the most part and 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 with those smartphone devices and the cameras there are now technologies that will essentially allow you to download an SPO2 device onto your uh, you know, iPhone or your, or your Samsung. So there are technologies from, interestingly, a lot of them are developed out of Israel. They use this capability called transdermal optical imaging. Okay. And with this video call, if I were to record it, I could probably tell you what your heart rate is, you know, with, with the technologies. Because there are when, when you when you breathe and when your heart rate happens, there are micro changes that happen within in your skin. And we can monitor that and essentially derive with 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 AI now and machine learning, we're able to go ahead and say, I know what this person's heart rate is. I know what their heart rate variability is because I can see it, and that's important. I can even measure what the oxygen saturation is in their in their bloodstream. So, you know, now can can you imagine I can actually download what used to be a medical device onto, you know, using software onto this. Right? Uh, I saw this one company out of Canada called, you know, Anura that essentially can do a blood pressure determination using just the smartphone camera. And it's relatively accurate. Uh, I've tested yeah. it with, we, we've got, uh, my wife's a cardiologist, so we've got blood pressure cuffs, we've got uh, SpO2 pulse ox devices and everything else, you know, in, in the home. And uh, so I test these against the software, software intelligence and triage devices against uh, hardware standards. And I'm really impressed with the accuracy of a lot of these. They don't, they don't quite qualify for medical because they haven't gone through the FDA certification process yeah. yet. But, but, but they will be, you know, SMDs, software medical devices, uh, in, in short order. So I think that kind of a technology that says this notion of a no touch triage capability is is really important. And that's yeah. very important during COVID and in the new normal as well. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, and and, and then the other thing, uh, I, I've uh, always been fascinated with this notion of wearables and technologies. I'm actually evaluating the Amazon Halo, you know, device. And and, and I, they, they have their place, you know, the, the the, the emergency response devices and the pendants and the watches that people wear are good. But the challenge with a lot of them is twofold. I've seen in my work with senior living communities, and I've worked for 10 years in senior living communities, that somehow pendants get lost behind the sofa and they get forget they, they forget to get charged. Got it. Because there is this whole, you know, I don't want to feel old, which is typically what, and, and, and this gray looking thing essentially makes you look old and feel old, you know. And that's why it'll get sabotaged by seniors. You know, it'll just get dropped behind uh, a sofa and they'll forget to charge it. And, and, and that's also real. They'll put it on the charger and then they'll forget to put it on. And then you miss it for two days the habit goes away and 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 Got so it. wearables don't get worn you know i think 86 percent of uh you know seniors that have wearables don't really conform to the 24 7 you know wearable regimen so i'm a big a believer in this whole notion of no touch whether it's monitoring triaging of any sort and 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 the two examples that i gave you bina.ai and you know, Anura, uh, the, the software enabled, you know, blood pressure and, you know, SpO2 stuff are really great. And, and, and I also believe that there are new technologies that are emerging. If you want to measure someone's activity level in, 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 in there, they're not wearing their, 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 their watch. So, uh, but so what, you know, uh, you can essentially use Doppler radar, uh, you know, devices 
they actually now even have the ability to take your general Wi-Fi signals in the home. And uh, you know, when you walk through a Wi-Fi signal or you, when you're even sitting there and your heart beats in a, in a, in a Wi-Fi environment, it disturbs that Wi-Fi signal in somewhere. Yeah. And it's called Wi-Fi Doppler. And you can take that Wi-Fi Doppler and it is practical solutions available today where you can where you, where you analyze it using AI and I can tell you what your heartbeat is. I can tell you if you're moving around or not. I can tell you if you're moving slower than you did yesterday. And I can I can see that over time you're getting up four times a night to go to the bathroom. So potential uh, signals of urinary tract infection, right? So there is a ton of triaging that can be done with just normal, simple things that almost exist today. By, because we're throwing away and we're flushing a lot of data down at this point, which we can really mine and start using. Excellent. So, I mean, I hope that gives you an idea of some of the technologies that are emerging that with minimal tweaks can be implemented. The, the, the marginal cost of uh, downloading the, an, an app on your phone is zero, right? And I can now have blood pressure cups everywhere and I can have SPO2 devices everywhere in India to, tomorrow. I've got old parents, you've also got old parents. There's a lot of apprehension around this vaccine. Obviously we are waiting for the phase three trial information as well because these were on emergency approval. So coming back to what I started in this transition time, a lot of senior citizens are apprehensive about, you know, the vaccine. Second, uh, they're also apprehensive, you know, should they get out home and what precautions or what devices can they, you know, use to actually, you know, become mobile. So in this phase, before, you know, everything goes back to the new normal, I just wanted to bring um, your thoughts or ideas once again on this whole point what are we seeing are we seeing some sort of you know conversational technologies or monitoring technologies which will play a role in this transition time till the new normal in the senior citizens lives i mean we've got arugya setu and all they do all this bluetooth based zoning and all and there are other technologies as well but are there anything uh, that you're seeing in in other parts of the world that we could probably bring it to india and you know, use it in the short uh, interim span of another six to eight months for our senior citizens. Uh, are, you, are you talking about what can we do to get them more active? Or are you talking about do we monitor them as we go out? Yeah, because see, some of them don't want to get immunized. Some of right. them uh, want to go out, but are scared of going out. Okay. You know, in so spite I, of I all the say... social distancing issues and norms in India, yeah. they 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 don't want to still venture out of home or for a limited, uh, they do venture out, but they are hesitant to venture out, you know, out of home. What can we do to give them confidence to be mobile? I'll... I'll address the question that you had about vaccination. I'm not a public health expert, so it's difficult to, to talk about the programs for vaccination. But I will tell you just from personal Are there any monitoring uh, uh, devices or uh, apps that can help them, uh, you know, see, okay, this is the reality. My friend had a vaccination, no adverse event. Some sort of a social media app or something that can give them confidence, okay, my friend had it instead of their calling or whatsapping or whatnot to you know allay their, their apprehensions around this whole vaccination i think in india the last vaccine they took was the dpt or the uh, at the age yeah. of six months which even they yes. don't recall the pain yeah. or, or whatever in their lives so for some yeah, of I, them I, this I, is a bigger I, issue or a challenge yeah I, I i have not seen any applications in the united states that uh, that uh, inform you if your friends have taken vaccinations and the reason is because of uh, hipaa Right. You know, yeah. that's, that's uh, you, you can't make that information public. And so it's social media that's essentially where people say, hey, I got vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated and I'll tell you about it. Uh, I have seen, on the other hand, uh, there are uh, COVID proximity apps that essentially Apple and Google have made made available that say, hey, you got exposed to somebody with COVID because you have the app and the other person has the app and then they got uh, diagnosed with COVID and they, they they hit yes, I got diagnosed with COVID. And then it basically says, I'll, I'll give you, I'll inform all the people that were in, in your proximity to let them know that they need to go get tested. Right. Right. So th that's there. But, you know, in terms of giving people confidence to go out, yeah, it's it's kind of a difficult thing unless you you can create this whole proximity app. I have a friend of mine who was working you know, on, a, on an app that basically will go ahead and you know do this, this this proximity app can be used to alert people to say hey you're close to someone with covid so just you know watch your distance right right uh, but i i don't know if that's 
you know, it's practical in a country like India where, you know, there's no the, distancing. Yeah, the, the distancing. Everything is social. Do? There's no distancing. Yeah. How do you get to distance? So, so then the, your only choice is, hey, I'm going to mask and I'm going to double mask. And by the way, I am going to cover my nose, not, you know, not just my mm-hmm. mouth. Yeah. So uh, I keep sending, you know, notes to my parents when I see pictures from India that say we're masked, uh, but, you know, we are their friends with mm-hmm. the noses uncovered. So, but you got to cover it. I also understand why they take it off because yeah, it's a lot of these masks are incredibly difficult to breathe, breathe in. Right. You know, I, I've recently now taken to wearing an N95 mask because we were able to get it. And uh, when I wear that and go into the market and 40 minutes in, uh, it's difficult and I get really warm and tired. So I've actually now ordered a a mask with a, a fan. It's, wow. uh, <laughs> you know, you can essentially charge it and it's got an N95 filter. And I order one for my wife actually, because as, as you know, when she's in the hospital, she's got to be masked all the time. Correct. And it's difficult to go stay masked for uh, you know for four hours when you're going through the wards, right? So uh, so I actually ordered it for her so that you know she can have a mask <laughs> that's got a good seal, and and then it's got a fan that'll blow air through the filters, and you change the filter every day, uh, right. and it's only the small filter, and and that will make it possible for you to uh, to essentially not just have a mask but a respirator that 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 you can you know, wear for a longer time. So I see the evolution of that happening a lot. It may be really expensive to do a mass deployment, even in the United States. It'll be expensive to go to mass deploy across uh, India. But those are things I would watch out for because uh, I would look at and I would encourage uh, you know, entrepreneurs and manufacturers in India to start saying, you know, this pandemic thing that we had just now is not just a unique event. We are probably going to see something once every decade, at least of, of this magnitude. And we're going to have to find a way to tamp it down. So this was a good dry rehearsal for a dry run for us. Let's prepare for the next bigger one. And we'll do that by by creating these masks that are easy to wear that people will wear. You know, you make it so it's transparent so I can see your face. And right. you know, and and it's got and it's got the fan. So I think that tech, that kind of a technology investment. Uh, would be worthwhile uh, pretty much across the globe. Let's shift uh, gears a little bit on the new normal. You know, senior citizens want to live independently as much as they want to. And we as their uh, caretakers and their parents and, you know, our relatives, there are different technologies that are emerging. Smart homes, wearable, monitoring, tracking, robot uh, to do some of the chores for them. If they are lonely, there are a whole host of conversational chatbots which are coming in uh, Again, Alexa and others, but even uh, other solutions on top of your Microsoft uh, uh, Azure platform. And then um, some digital solutions, emergency response for them, safety and security when they're living alone. And lastly, but not the fitness and mental and wellness as well. So let's talk about some of these points in the new normal. Where do you see these things going for the senior citizens? Are there anything promising uh, that you're seeing uh, in any of these uh, technologies? as well so from a smart home you know my parents use a samsung device and there is could put um, the smart home app and then you can put all those sensors at least in my in some of things we have just put those sensors so that if there is any there's a trigger and all so they are very cheap solutions which are already there but are there anything new that uh, will happen in the new normal as well and your thoughts on on smart homes because that's where it will enable them to live uh, independently and not have people like us come and stay on an extended period of time to take care of them, especially during pandemic, have them their peace of mind. Well, look, I think, you know, uh, I, I try not to look at technology first and then look at what, what you know, what, what, what might work. I try to look at what does what does someone need when they're when they're li- when they're living at home? They need safety and security, and and then they need something that essentially says in an emergency I need to be able to reach out. To them. Correct. And then there's something that says I've got a couple of daily things that that I need to do that I sometimes need help with. And, uh, and most importantly, I want to make sure that I feel happy and uh, and and I feel like I'm needed and I can talk to people and I can I can do stuff, right? So from a safety and security perspective, the simplest of devices uh, in terms of the smart home, you know, you take an Alexa, Google, you know, or any of these devices, and if you were to just attach the ability to go, so they can just say, turn the light on for me, right? It's great because where are the light switches typically? They're towards the corner, and sometimes there is a sofa sitting in uh, uh, right in front of it, and they lean over, and what happens is a fall, 
so I look at a home, uh, any home for that matter now, with the lens of, is that a fall risk? You know, I look at the carpets and I say, hey, there, there's a li- the carpet is not stretched properly, it's a, it's a fall risk. You know, and, and, I, and I look at where the light switches are and I see what's in front of it and I see if that's a fall risk. And I can avoid that uh, by just being essentially voice enabling that stuff. I can say automatic temperature monitoring capabilities uh, uh, that, that that will tell you. As a matter of fact, CVS just released this uh, new product called Symphony, CVS Health, and they released a product called Symphony. And I'm really excited because they're one of the first people that has a national presence across the country. They have basically 30,000 pharmacists, 10,000 pharmacies across the United States, and uh, they're going to be able to support these technologies once they deploy it. Right. Uh, And they've deployed this thing, which will essentially monitor you. And if it's an emergency, you can just tell it in an emergency. I I can't use the word because it'll 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 fire up here. And uh, and and it'll essentially ask you if there is if there is a problem and do do, do I need to to respond to something. So I, I think it's I think it's important to kind of have things that make it possible for them to not have to, you know, reach and, and, and do things. Right. And then the other part of it is yes, it is a solution for seniors, but it, what we really need to do is not just look at them, we need to look at the support structure that they have and enable the support structure around them, which is the caregivers, the families, the friends, the society around them. What is it that we can do to create an infrastructure they can share information amongst themselves? Like for example, if you have like three kids uh, and, and, and the parent is there, if I talk to mom or dad, it would be really nice to just kind of do a quick button check so all of my other siblings know that I spoke to mom or dad and they're okay. So there, and, 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 and I'd like to have an indication that says nobody's spoken to mom or dad in three days. You know, just a quick little heads up. Mm. You know, not, not a, nothing more than somebody tapping you on your shoulder, right? It's the tap on the shoulder that we all, that we all need. And technology now makes it possible for that to happen. And it's not, it's not rocket science technology. Correct. Right? It is just technology that's been used because we thought about the problem of what it is that that we're really looking for the seniors to do. And there are other things that we need to now enable better. For example, cooking's an issue for them. So then, you know, let's find a way for the rest, you know, delivery services, you know, things like DoorDash and other, you know, India's got a whole bunch of uh, delivery services. Swiggy and, and, and what yeah, have you. Yes. That are emerging. And, 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 and the great thing about India is they've always had home food delivery, home drug delivery, home, all of that stuff. And which right. is only now really starting to happen here in the, in the, in the, in the Western societies. So that it is now possible for, for that to happen. Here we have TaskRabbit, which allows me to go request somebody to come in and change a bulb. You know, something happens in my home you know, I can do that. Now, if there is a, um, if, if I have a support you know, a group of people around me, I can use that that caregiver app to basically say, hey, I need to get a bulb change whenever somebody's got time, just show up. You know, and the person can just pick up the task, right? So so I think it's it's just the activities of daily living and and, and some of the risk factors that essentially we need, we need to we need to address. And I will say, and I keep coming back to falls because, you know, one third of seniors over 65 fall every year. And in, in, and especially if somebody with, uh, you know, comorbidities like, you know, diabetes and, and, and things like that, uh, the healing problem is a big, big issue. On right. the average, it, when, when a senior falls, it is less than a few months, about seven to eight weeks that they end, uh, a large part of them end up passing because it's very difficult to recover. They fall and break a hip and go to the hospital. You know, you, you, you're talking about an issue where you really have to be. So, I've so seen we this just need to help. Great grand mom uh, at the age of uh, 78, she was walking and she fell down and uh, had a job, but she could never walk after that. And it was a downhill style for her and decay and slowing down of her life and lifestyle. You brought up a very important point in terms of enabling the life around being able to digitally order for services uh, and stuff. There is a small study that was done here in India, and I'm not sure what the numbers look like, but uh, the digital penetration in uh, India is just five less than 5% of the 130 million population. So you can imagine, you know, 95% of them are digital uh, are natives, have not had, they may want to use it, but they are not at a senior citizen enabled of, you know, apps or services. So that brings up to a big question about uh, digital education or awareness for the senior citizens so that they are able to manage 
and order the services goods that they require on a daily basis through the digital platforms what's your thought there what should uh, I, actually, the existing yeah. players and 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 what your doordash and we have our swiggies and and uh, zomatos and dunzos of the world what should they be really doing for a senior citizen to be a uh, senior friendly in their service perhaps so let me let me let me back up uh, there is uh, i'm actually on the on the advisory board of an organization called cyberseniors.org and cyber seniors ba- uh, basically puts together high school seniors and uh, seniors together mm-hmm. so that there is uh, technology education one way and hopefully wisdom transfer the other way okay. and there are probably about a half a dozen organizations that i know of that uh, have evolved in this space that are specifically oriented towards training seniors on technology i think that's kind of a wrong approach but you know it's but that's what we live with and so we're going to have to deal with helping them with the current environment Mm. If I was in a doing a, a service of any sort, I'd basically say, what are seniors comfortable with? They're comfortable with talking. I would make everything voice enabled. Okay. I take, a, I mean, I'd make everything voice enabled, and I'd probably put a screen on it if they're comfortable touching something. You know, otherwise I'll make everything voice enabled. And I think voice first is an approach that I think we need to look at for just about everything okay. because you know we've grown up storytelling, we've grown up you know speaking much long before writing, and everybody's comfortable with it. Now we just need to make that whole voice environment more friendly and we're starting to evolve into that. We're starting to see even with some of the Alexa devices and all, uh, we're starting to see it say, did you mean this? You know, is this what you meant? I don't exactly get it. And you know, that kind of an interactive conversation, you know, that is starting to happen is just really important. And you know, we're we're still seeing evolution in banking and other industries where we're having this whole multi-platform conversational AI interactions. You know, I can start an interaction on a on my phone. You know, swap it over to my uh, uh, my, my 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 mobile device, and then and then I can you know uh, head over to a voice uh, uh, device, and I can carry on an interaction if I can program it the right way, right? Correct. But I think for for seniors, we need to go ahead and say, what's what is it that you're most comfortable doing? Right? You're most comfortable talking. And I'll enable the services. My Zomato service really needs to say, you know, is there a way I can set something up for you? You know, you normally like to order six things. Correct. Right? I don't want you to go through a 20 menu item. I'll basically Correct. say, look, you ordered these four things the last time. Is this something you'd like to order? Because Amazon does it today. Correct. Right? Amazon does it today. They basically send me a notification reminder saying, hey, you ordered toilet paper three months ago when we had a crisis. Uh, you know, did you want to order it again? So, right. uh, so <laughs> the technology is not is not foreign, it's not new, it's emerged, it's there, it's deployed across in scale. We just need to start reorienting our brains in terms of how do we make it possible. And honestly, I believe that whether it is deploying for seniors or whether it's deploying for accessibility and reasons where we're catering to folks who are disabled, those kinds of edge deployments of ease of use really also benefit the general population in terms of right. they make much better user interfaces uh, if we design for the uh, for the people that have difficulty dealing with technology so here's what i'm 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 get try to move the technology behind the voice yes your app is there let the app has have a layer of a conversational chatbot or interface uh, using voice uh, that can enable the whole roster of services behind the app and enable that and make that as a as a ease of use for uh, the seniors that's a great idea unfortunately what's your view on on conversational bots because we have had i would say a lukewarm or i, I would say 50 50 kind of experience in india on our on our covid bot which we launched uh, obviously uh, different languages so you know there's a translational layer different way people speak so recognition issues and then certain amount of latency going to the cloud and sure. you know trying to do that so it's not a real conversational experience that we are still there uh, i'm not sure what how it, the things are in the, on the us side but yes um, i mean it's starting i think we should be there in next 2 years or 3 years with with a much better uh, experience of a conversation with different dialects and different tones and tonalities and in India because you've got tons of languages here. That diversity would be obviously the technology would have to surface and, and move forward as well. So what's your view? When do you think this technology can really mature? 
first for the general masses and then we can talk about getting it specifically to you know the senior citizens look any early technology i remember the i remember the days of the formative formative days of the internet you know where folks are like wow you know this stuff is just a toy right what use is it to for me to go use a mouse to go do stuff and i really got excited the first time i saw a car commercial where there was a mouse you know, essentially pointing to something. And we're probably in the early stages of that, like with, with AI deployment, and, you know, uh, and a lot of these conversational bots have like an AI engine on the back end. We're still in the early stages of it, right? So when we say it doesn't work, it's because it's still early, it's bad. It's like a 1930s car. And, you know, if I were to take a look at a 1930s, 1940s car, we're probably gonna say, eh, eh, really, what, what uses this thing? My horse can go faster. Maybe not in the 1930s, but you know, a little earlier than that. Uh, <laughs> okay. And so I, I think I think the technology will evolve because the needs are going to make it evolve to it. You know, I believe uh, again, when you talk about whether you talk about kids or whether you talk about senior citizens, the most you know sophisticated technology is what you need to deploy for the least sophisticated user. Okay. Right. That's yeah, great, the most uh, advanced technology has to be deployed. If I, especially, I, I need I need magic. Basically, I need the doors to open on their own. You know, I need my wheelchair to essentially mobilize on its own, avoid obstacles, and get me to some. You know, I need a you know a a, 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 a drone robot in my home that will go get the medicine for me and bring it back. Right. And that's those a smart mobility. <laughs> yeah. Auto mobility device. Uh, I would say that can do all the chores for them. Yeah, and and and, and I think we also then, when, when, the, when the technology changes, we also need to refi- redefine what is it that we're looking for. You know, it, it's, it's uh, it, we didn't need faster horses. Uh, we didn't need more horses. We just needed to change the technology to an automobile. Now the question is, do you need the automobile at all? Or is that a way to go avoid the automobile? And the COVID's kind of told us, you know what, you can really avoid the automobile in a lot of different ways. Because, you know, if I can just make this, this remote technology better, if I can increase the band, with, they can standardize it. And the next step of that is I'm going to make it a virtual office. So my glass has now become a, 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 an AR VR uh, deployment, which allows me to then really see you next to me on the left side where we're not physically together. There's a company uh, in Boston called Rendever. And uh, I mean, and I love their technology because they will do a collaborative tour of the Vatican for six seniors sitting next to each other. So you guys are all together and you're like in the back, right? So Somebody's this is a big tour. impact to the travel and the fledgling travel and tourism industry because a lot of senior citizens travel yes. as part of their thing. And if you give this technology, I'm sure the airline industry, the hotel and hospitality industry and everyone would really get impacted. So yeah, you're but it's getting not gonna be, a it, virtual it, it, it experience a... to the physical, you know, that a lot of senior citizens do as part of their you know ways of ending time and experiencing a good life i don't know if it'll if it'll kill it maybe it'll expand more people to travel than it was ever possible and it may be better right eventually it'll make travel different right it'll change the nature of the industry the fact that i don't need to go to the office <laughs> doesn't mean i don't want to be in the office right if I, I mean, I, I still create that uh, face-to-face interaction. Now, the more the face-to-face interaction uh, in a, this AR environment can simulate it, then you know you may crave it a little, little less. Yeah, you know, and uh, but you'll still need the physical touch. You know, until somebody comes up with these haptic, glo- haptic gloves that essentially simulate the, the the sense of touch. Yeah, and they're there. They're there. You know, in, 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 in some of the, the some of the experimental so. environments. Yeah. You know, and the and the adult industry is is certainly you know one of the leaders in in, uh, in technologies in this area. But I but I think you know we need to rethink it. We need to, to rethink to say what is it that this they're looking for. If I need food, then I can get the food to them. If I need medicine, I can get the food the medicine to them. If I need fresh air. Then I can say, let me enable fresh air for you by taking you out, right? So I, I don't need the, the the chore trips. I need the enjoyment trips, which is which essentially changes the nature of travel. But but I think we have now to to say let's let's fundamentally rethink what the need is, what the what the real need is, and see if there is a way that this new technology environment can deliver that to you. And one one of the things, for example, I've been uh, you know working on is this notion of what is it that you need to do to uh, help a senior age in place. And yeah. and we said, okay, 
let's take a look at what their fundamental needs are. We went through this whole thing, you know, as a safety and security, it is uh, yeah, a, a, a level of companionship and economics uh, associated with it, purpose in life, uh, you know, education, acquisition of knowledge, you know, and all of those things. And we've said, well, maybe we uh, there are programs that are there uh, in silos. Uh, let's put it all together. There's a program uh, run out of Johns Hopkins University called Capable in the United States. It's been running for about 10 years and hopefully it'll get more popular soon. It essentially works with seniors. Uh, and what they do is they take a nurse, an occupational therapist and a maintenance person and they go to the senior's home and then they say, what do you like to do? What are your issues at home? Uh, and one story was, there was this lady who said, you know, I really wish my son didn't have to come here every two weeks. I'm in a wheelchair. I wish my I wish my son didn't have to come here every every week or two weeks to wash my hair. It's it's a matter of dignity for her, you know, that she had to depend on her son and there was nobody else to do it and she couldn't afford it any other way. So son used to come and wash her hair. So the occupational therapist and the and the maintenance person looked at it and said, hmm, maybe we can figure it out. Look at your wheelchair so I can create this large sink and I can install it for a few hundred dollars. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put a washing sink uh, that you can reach from your wheelchair. That fundamentally changed her level of independence and it, and it impacts all other aspects of life. Just because I'm now independent, I can feel more, you know, more like I'm in control of my life. Yeah, that brings up to two points that I want to delve further. One, we talked about companionship. I want to take that a little bit deeper. The second is personalization and personalization solutions for independent independent living. I guess that could be a big opportunity per se. I mean, you know, just putting up a sink or whatever. That's personalization for their independent living. So on companionship, obviously Indian cultures, old people, it is, you know, their age of meditation. People are reserved. I don't want to be living alone. Companionship is very much important. I guess there is a little bit of societal change. Uh, I guess the digital types of apps of, of Tinder and don't really work with seniors, right? Are there anything you're seeing in the societies in the West that are enabling this sort of solutions for companionship in the seniors? I mean, there are certainly targeted applications like silver singles and things like that. You know, I mean, for, 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 for a friendship, they, they, they target things differently. I mean, uh, Tinder gets in the United States, uh, you get used in the United States a little bit differently than Tinder gets used in India, I understand. You know, and no, I just um, give an example Tinder for the yeah, elders, seniors, yeah. you know, seniors but, citizens. but like Silver Singles is, 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 is an app that's emerged that are like probably another half a dozen if I went and looked for it that basically say, look, there's the reality is that we essentially need companionships and we've got to find a find a forum for it. There's an organization called Silver Nest, mm. and what's and there's another company uh, that I'm, I'm essentially I just finished writing an article for these guys called Upside Home, and what they do is um, they will do a personality match and they will create and, and they'll essentially create roommate situations. Okay. And this is not male, female only. It is, it could be like the golden girls type of a thing where you say, you know, three women look together, live together, you know, mm. three women. I mean, and in this community, you can have a man and a, a, a male and a female live together or two women and one man live together. I mean, that, that combination can happen based on what your personalities and what your needs are. But the idea is let's find the right personality match and, uh, and, and essentially see if we can create the roommate situation. So it addresses the social isolation issue. Yeah. Number one, number two, it, uh, it addresses the economics issue that says, look, it's a lot economical, more economical for three people to live together in this one. One place and let's make that happen now on top of that they layer these services that say okay we're gonna make uh, and most seniors really in in, uh, in the u.s don't want to live in a senior living community i mean they want to live in the larger society so what upside home does is they find five apartments in a large multi multi-generational building and then they'll essentially maintain it and they'll start they'll service them they'll make sure that food gets delivered they'll get you know maintenance gets done they have one single bill so the senior doesn't is not responsible for the electricity bill and the, the TV bill and the this and the that you know so it's just one single bill that that gets addressed and 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 they also create a concierge type of a thing where this concierge is responsible for maybe 50 apartments and then they will create opportunities for people to meet. They will create engagement opportunity, right? So it, it kind of addresses those those kinds. And I think that's probably an opportunity that will emerge in India significantly. Uh, yeah, where, you know, there's a lot of taboo 
uh, in our society, you know, the guy has left his parents in Vidash. That's the colloquial in the old age. What I was really thinking was, can we have a WeWorks type of a model for co-living for seniors? Yeah, you certainly. Know, Co-housing uh, is and a huge it's not a real estate States. model. And all these developers create yeah. these sort of apartments with all the, the bouquet of services and everything around it. But a co-living model, which we far more dignified for the senior citizens, and maybe we work with the government to say, okay, of certain tax and other uh, rebates since they are senior citizens, because the government anyway encourages a lot of these sort of services to be put in uh, discounts for whether it's travel or what for mm -hmm. senior citizens. I guess uh, that should really work with the government and our policy people's encouragement in India. What do you think? I, I happen to believe that co-living, co-housing, is the model of the future across the globe. My wife and kids make fun of me because I keep thinking, I keep saying that this whole concept of a nuclear family is a short failed experiment for humanity. You know, it, it didn't exist 300 years ago, 200 years ago. It didn't, you know, it probably won't exist, you know, another 150 years from now. Because in that time frame, we've experimented with this nuclear family thing. And we now realize that it's got consequences in its own, in, in its own right. I mean, the family may look different. It may not be the biological family you grew up with, but it may just be some sort of a family that says, let's share in some of the responsibilities to let the village bring up the children. Let's share in the responsibilities to let our village take care of the elders because it is difficult for just two people to take care of it. And especially with the demographic changes that we're seeing. Uh, you mentioned that India has got 10% of its uh, population. Is not and that's almost 50% uh, of US population, 130 million. But, this, but if you take a look at India, by 2050, 44% of the population is going to be seniors. Correct. That essentially means the number of people that can support them are also a lot smaller. Correct. So what do you do? You have to make that more efficient. You got to use technology. You got to use this responsibility sharing capabilities using co-housing. So it's not a it's not a matter of is it going to happen. It's a matter of when is it going to happen and how is it going to happen. Uh, I kind of feel like it's almost as inevitable as things like cryptocurrency. You know, I mean, like you know, it's it's going to be there. It's a matter of when. And you know what happens is then you can probably even get the whole personalization done. Yes. Okay. Three people, different needs. You already done that okay the decor needs to be different like what vworks does for different companies yeah. different uh, tenants yep. in a different way and manages it yeah. so that's in the office environment but i guess it's like we live also, right i mean they, they've got the we live thing right and all right. so same same kind of stuff and, and then really uh, does away all this whole issue of hospice is other uh, social uh, issues relating to relatives saying okay this is my property the church or the other guys provider saying it was assigned to me and a lot of legal battles in india mm. so i'm not sure how much legal battles in us you have on properties and such unassigned uh, you know, <laughs> rights given to different people out of uh, heart uh, by their seniors, but you know, contested by their relatives later on. I think property issues are a little bit easier to deal with in the, in the US in general than, than, than they are in India. In the, uh, India. And, I guess and, the and, next and, and generation and, will get the benefit of. Uh, but but I think but I think the government really needs to look at this as a as a, as a long term issue, right? For for uh, for India in particular, a everything in India the numbers are humongous. The uh, you know, but and the, but this notion of 44% of the population essentially becoming elders, then you have all these elder abandonment issues that 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 are going to be really surfacing hard in India. I mean, it, it's it's starting to surface across uh, all societies. But for some reason, the demographics in the United States basically say that we're only going to be 22%, you know, seniors in the 2050 time frame, as opposed to India being, you know, 44%. The the, the demographic dividend that you currently have is going to come back. To, to be a bomb down the road. Right. China is already facing that. Yeah. I mean, and right. that's because of their, their one child policy, right? You've essentially right. got one couple having eight people to take care of, you know, two, right. uh, like four parents and, you know, and, 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 yeah. and, and their grandparents. Eight grandparents. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and the longevity dividend that we have causes those, there are benefits and issues associated with it. On the average, Correct. we've gained uh, three years for every decade of life in the last, uh, in the last century. But since 20, 2010 through 2015, it, it became five years in every decade, and 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 I think that there were there are there are people at that point were predicting that you could lead, uh, reach what's called longevity escape velocity by the time you're in 2045, which means every year the lifespan's going to increase one year. 
And you know, although the, the COVID has uh, numbers have not been reflected in all of that, but it's only in the last year in the United States, for example, lifespan has decreased you know, because of chronic diseases and things that are that are really starting to take hold. I want to shift gears, uh, Ravi, and talk a little bit on innovation and startup in US and in India. So I have been visit- making rounds on Coulter Foundation based in support with all the innovators from the academic uh, medical research centers across the US. Uh, some of the issues that I keep hearing and what you have mentioned, India is going to have 44% of elders or senior citizens by 2050. Uh, the price point that uh, some of the innovators there come up for a smaller market, they make it up uh, the profit on a larger volume. Mm-hmm. And that's what is the whole attraction of India. About uh, eight years back, when I was going back to US to evaluate a partner to come back and work with me on assisted living, and the field was the America pond was too big. They were happy with uh, the whole opportunity. Now we have a lot of Australian and many other folks from this side of the world who are already entering in the India market. What sort of communication uh, in the US ecosystem for innovators and startups on elder care, uh, technology around aging, uh, senior citizens, you like to probably convey and how can we convince them to come to India and you work on the innovation on a larger mass market opportunity. Uh, again, I have a friend of mine is a professor that works on a lot of this innovation framework, uh, an Indian guy by the name of Ram Mudambi at uh, Temple University. So he might be a better guy to answer this question in terms of the larger policy level question. But I will you know, go back to this notion of do we need to convince U.S. innovators to come to India to work on something? Or can we just find the innovation in India? Jugad, because, that is our Jugad innovation then. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, HealthCube is an organization that's in India. And you know they've put together a, a device that essentially does multiple diagnostics you know, in, in, in a very economical way. And I think it's being deployed by the Birla Foundation and folks like that for you know, blood tests across different places. And and I'm sure there, are, if we look around with the level of innovation incubators that are in India today, within a course of 12 to 24 months, you'll be able to come up with some you know, incredible homegrown innovations that you can essentially spread across the country. Yeah, I was talking to an organization that runs 200 trucks in, in UP that essentially, uh, they're basically medical trucks. Yeah, and they go like once once every three months, they visit some place and then they'll they'll essentially move off. And uh, we were talking about what is it that you can do to take the ASHA workers that are in these communities and leave them a briefcase so that while you're not there for those three months, they can still essentially do some level of triaging and send you information. So I was advising this company called Elara Health that uh, is actually operating out of uh, Kenya uh, and, and also some in Rwanda right now. And so Emilian uh, Pope was the CEO of the company. David David, he's essentially uh, from a finance and investment background, kind of like you. And he put together the solution, which is a, a clinic in a suitcase. So he's taken the butterfly hardware that's here for mm. uh, EKGs, uh, you know, uh, yeah, with, with the iPhone and a bunch of other things. And he's kind of created this little framework where you can essentially give it to a nurse in Kenya and say, hey, operate a clinic out of this thing and you can do you know prenatal you know, diagnostics and you know uh, a lot a lot of disease diagnostics can be done pretty much out of this the, the, this this kind of a, a clinic and a suitcase but what he's also done which i really like is uh he's created a financing model that basically says you can't buy this it's cost three thousand dollars there's no way you can afford to buy something like this right so i'm going to create a leasing model for you that mm. will that makes me a partner in your clinic for a period of seven years yeah, and, and and I think that kind of an innovation where you've taken something that is more individualistic solutions, adapted it a little bit and put it in. For example, even if people can't afford smartphones, right? What can I do to fix that? I mean, I, I, I can essentially have one phone and a smartphone and and and, and essentially or, or, or an iPad or, or a camera and have people walk by it. Now I've done your daily blood pressure thing. You know, as you're coming into work, everybody's blood pressure is measured. Everybody's oxygenation level level is measured, right? So you just adapt the technology for the population. So I, I would highly encourage, you know, domestic growth rather than, you know, yeah, we can look, but if we adapt, we take these existing technologies and, you know, we pay respects to them and we adapt the technology for uh, for, for this market. That's a nice, nice way to go around rather than, you know, what we were looking at 
people to work and bring the innovation and partner model. Uh, before I let you know, we I want I have one last question. That level of insights and what you have provided on on our talk today. I want to know, you know, what are your resources and follow and for the sake of our folks here to be on top of the global trends in your senior elder care, aging, independent living, assisted living, whatever you call. If you can enlighten some of our audiences, that will be really great. Sure. I mean, there are probably a half a dozen people that are just incredible in this space. None of my ideas are ever original. I just listen to a lot of uh, a lot of the things that those folks say and it makes me sound somewhat intelligent. You know, uh, Lori Orlov runs a newsletter which essentially is called Aging in Tech and she's uh, probably one of the most uh, you know well known uh, in in this space for population demographics and things like that. Ken Dykewald is a significant resource. And for business models and senior living, Bob Kramer from Nexus Insights is uh, is one to look at. So th these are the three that come top of mind, but I probably have a list of about a dozen that I keep so that I can go back and remember to check on them. Excellent. Ravi, we are running out of time, but uh, it was indeed a pleasure talking to you, interacting with you. We all are going through this transitional phase of taking care of our our parents and our kids also in this uh, un normal uh, pandemic phase. So we as a generation had this burden to carry for the last one year or two years now to be able to take care of both the generations in front of us and ahead of us as well. And a lot of them have been stressed out as well. I hope some of the things that you talked about would really help our listeners and some of the seniors who also are listening on our podcast would also be encouraged to try out the technologies and be far more digitally active to be able to be live independently as well. Uh, before I let you go, I need to thank uh, our sponsors, our team that has uh, made this possible, our production team at the back end as well. Uh, we are going to come back, quote unquote, uh, wealthy to talk about the future of startups. Thank you so much, Ravi, for talking to us and giving us this time, really being candid in, in, in talking about the fear of technology, which is there in, in, in some of our parents and our seniors and how they can probably be able to adopt it and work around it. For them, yeah, it's Absolutely. our job to make it easy for them. Yeah, keep it simple for yes. them. Yes, Thanks so much. All right, uh, thank you. And stay Pleasure. safe. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Thank <laughs> you.